as I said, today is um, Children's Book Sunday and Alexander. <laughs> How many have read this book before? Okay, there's still a few that, that have not. This was a favorite of our kids. Um, I'm not sure it says when this was published. Um, find it here. 1972, Whew. a long time ago. But the phrase, um, let's see here, Alexander there in color, I, I don't know if the rest of these pictures are going to be color or black and white, but that's, that's our friend here who's going to speak on our behalf in regard to times when we're not so happy with how things are going. And... Uh, and the phrase, let's go ahead to the first page here. So when we come to that part, if you follow down to the end of the last sentence, I could tell it was going to be, and we'll say this part together, it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Anybody had one of those lately? Yeah. Maybe we should put the word uh, year uh, in the end there. Um, so otherwise, I'm not sure if there's any spiritual application at all um, to this, but uh, you'll see how we get there, I think. Um, but in, in the writer's concept, I don't know that they envisioned that um, fitting into a sermon, but I think it will help. And, and Paul is going to accompany us again as he does so often. <laughs> I went to sleep with gum in my mouth, and now there's gum in my hair. <laughs> and when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard, and, and by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running, and I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At breakfast... Anthony found a Corvette Stingray car kit in his breakfast cereal box, and, and Nick found a junior undercover agent code ring in his breakfast cereal box, but in my breakfast cereal box, all I found was breakfast cereal. I think I'll move to Australia. I don't know why that's, that works for some reason, but... In the carpool, Mrs. Gibson let Becky have a seat by the window. Audrey and Elliot got seats by the window too and I said I was being scrunched I said I was being smushed I said if I don't get a seat by the window I'm going to be car sick no one even answered I could tell it was going to be a terrible horrible no good very bad day at school, Mrs. Dickens liked Paul's picture of the sailboat better than my picture of the invisible castle. You guys picked up on that pretty quick. At singing time, she said, I sang too loud. At counting time, she said, I left out 16. Who needs 16? I could tell it was going to be a very bad day. I could tell because Paul said it, it, I wasn't his best friend anymore. He said that Philip Parker was his best friend and that Albert Moyo was his next best friend and that I was only his third best friend. I hope you sit on a tack, I said to Paul. I hope the next time you get a double-decker strawberry ice cream cone, the ice cream part falls off the cone and lands in Australia. <laughs> There were two cupcakes in Philip Parker's lunch bag and Albert got a Hershey bar with almonds and Paul's mother gave him a piece of jelly roll that had little coconut sprinkles on the top. Guess whose mother forgot to put in dessert? It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Well, that's what it was. Because after school, my mom took us all to the dentist and Dr. Fields found a cavity just in me. Come back next week and I'll fix it, said Dr. Fields. 
Next week, I said, I'm going to Australia. <laughs> on the way downstairs, the elevator door closed on my foot while we were waiting for my mom to get in the, get the car. Anthony made me fall where it was muddy, and, and then when I started crying because of the mud, Nick said I was a crybaby. <sighs> and while I was punching Nick <laughs> for saying crybaby, my mom came back with the car and scolded me for being muddy and fighting. There is just no justice, <laughs> except in Australia, I think. I am having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And no one even answered. So then we went to the shoe store to buy some sneakers. Anthony chose white ones with blue stripes. Nick chose red ones with white stripes. I chose blue ones with red stripes. But the shoe man said, we're all sold out. They made me buy plain old white shoes. But they can't make me wear them. When we picked up my dad at his office, he said, I couldn't play with the copying machine, but I forgot. He also said to watch out for the books on his desk, and I was careful as could be except for my elbow. He also said, don't fool around with his phone, but I think I called Australia. My dad said, please don't pick him up anymore. It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. There were lima beans for dinner, and I hate limas. There was kissing on TV, and I hate kissing. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> my bath was too hot. I got soap in my eyes. My marble went down the drain, and I had to wear my railroad train pajamas, and I hate my railroad train pajamas. When I went to bed, Nick took the pillow. He said I, I could keep, and the Mickey Mouse nightlight burned out and I bit my tongue. The cat wants to sleep with Anthony, not me. It has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. My mom says, some days are just like that, even in Australia. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. So as I said, if, uh, if your family is here with kids, um, we have a handful of these books and we can get those to you. I chose one line out of it, uh, out of our story, to use as a title this morning, and it's the line, I said I was being scrunched. I said I was being scrunched. I don't know if scrunched was a word that I'd heard before I read that book. Um, but I'm going to kind of share with you what I feel like it, it says to us, um, or it means to me anyway. Last week after the service, I was standing over here and I was speaking with a handful of the younger folks that were gathered over there. And we were talking about, well, we were talking about the message um, that Denise had shared with us and, and the concepts of, of joy the joy that's available in Jesus. And uh, we were discussing how so it can be so hard. And, and Denise, uh, it was such a wonderful message. Thank you, Denise. And, and the message that kind of rang through, not just what she shared, but the people who came up here on the platform and, and told us about, and I'm using this word kind of uh, maybe it's not the exact right word, but folks who basically said that to get to joy, most of them had gone through a time of feeling pretty scrunched uh, or squeezed or in a difficult spot. And moving through that into joy came to them as they stepped into uh, deeper or uh, more current 
relationship to Christ. And so every story and the message that, that was shared brought those two things together. My, uh, my joy and my strength uh, comes from my relationship to Jesus. And so I kind of wanted to unpack that a, a little bit in, in a way in this message. And I've been sorting on this ever since I, I shared the message back in Acts chapter 16 quite a while ago. In that conversation with uh, Faith and Victoria and Nicholas uh, and there was a, a few other folks over here. They said it's so hard right now to, to kind of experience that joy. It's been hard for a long, long time. And, and the reason that they, that they said it was so difficult was they just said the voice of, of distraction, the noise of distraction, the noise of anger, the noise of frustration is so loud it's hard to hear the voice of joy. And we kind of all lamented that. And that as I was talking with them, I just kind of said, you know, it's in these moments that we really have to cultivate our ability to be still and know. Amen? But when the noise is so loud... And the answer is, be still and know. That's a hard thing to, like I said, cultivate. It has to be grown sometimes in rocky ground. We're living in a time of rocky ground for cultivating joy. So this scripture that I, I shared with you is, we're, and we'll go back to Acts in a few weeks or at some point anyway, but... The scripture that, uh, that I have kind of been focused on, and I'm going to touch on some things that you've heard before, and I'm going to move through it pretty quick because uh, we don't have a lot of time, but it's in Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 18, and you'll recall this story if you were here when we were working through that passage. It's the development of the church, and, and there's a group of folks gathered who are sharing about the news of Jesus headed by Paul and Silas and some others. So verse 16 reads this way. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us. The person who's writing this is Luke, by the way. So she followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. And finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. And I won't get into this part because we talked about it at the, during the message a while back. But everything that, that this spirit that is possessing this woman, everything that is said is true. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. So it doesn't have anything to do with what's being said. And I'm not going to unpack that like I said, but it just tells you that sometimes... Uh, what appears to be out front is not always what is in the center of what's going on. And it's the center of what's going on that Paul has a problem with. I also shared this with you. In the English here, it just says, a uh, female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. In the original Greek, that spirit is named. It says, uh, actually, pneuma puthona. A python spirit. And it has to do with some of the Greek God worship history that was a part of that area. Pneuma puthona. 
If we translate that kind of into English, the oo is, becomes a y, and so we would pronounce it python spirit, okay? So what does a python do in order to eat its victims? What does a python do? Scrunches, squeezes, until it can get it to a place that it can digest it. Um, and that's how it eliminates life from it, wraps its, its whole body around it. It's, so in this case, other translations in English also say she had an unclean spirit. But what is happening here is, is really significant in that scrunching and squeezing concept. As you, as you read through here, you notice First of all, they were going to have a, a prayer moment together. They were coming together to be nurtured by the Spirit of God and to do it in a communal kind of way. As we were going to this place of prayer. So we're moving into this moment that is supposed to be dedicated to the Spirit of God moving among us. And instead, there is this woman, it doesn't say she has a megaphone, but it feels like she does, and is walking around and shouting these things. It's a distraction. I've said this to you before. I think that the enemy's tactics oftentimes can fall into at least a couple of uh, three categories. Distraction, distortion, and disconnect. He wants to distract us from what it is that God wants us to see or distort the image of God that we have so that we don't pursue him or disconnect us from him and even from each other and so that's what we see kind of funneling into this to this moment these people are coming into a worship context and this Numa Puthona, working through this woman, is taking them away. Squeezing the Holy Spirit from acting in the lives of those who are gathered there. And Paul recognizes this, verse 18, like I said, she kept this up for many days. I, I ignored that part for a while. I, I always think of Paul as being pretty immediate on things. But it, it says this, uh, this happened for many days. And so Paul even was trying to be patient with this. But then it says he became so annoyed. I told you in that last message, I'm so glad to hear that somebody who is a biblical character gets annoyed. Because I do sometimes. So she kept this up for many days. But Paul then, as the shepherd leader of what is going on, as I said, he becomes annoyed and then he acts on that. The word that, the word that is uh, there as annoyed is, uh, let me see if I can find it. There it is. Diaponeo. And it means thorough or intensely. It's a combination of two words, dia and poneo. Thorough or intensely labor and toil. So together it's an exhausting, depleting Fiercely fatigued, that's all wrapped up into his annoyance. I am exhausted with this, this distraction, this distortion of what ought to be happening here. I am fatigued. And so he says, that's enough. And he calls her out. And the reason is because he, he knew what was supposed to be happening. If you go back to the beginning, like I said, this was supposed to be a place of prayer. But it's become this personal moment for this lady to do what she's been doing, which is drawing attention to herself, really. So back to my dialogue that I had with these folks over here last week. Another concept that came into our discussion was I said, so according to scripture, what does the enemy do? I, I said, I gave those three D's because that's what pastors do. We find three things in a letter that goes with all of them. But according to scripture, the enemy comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. That fits. So at this time... In this story that we're looking at, at this time where they were supposed to be coming to do this, the enemy is at work attempting to steal, kill, and destroy the moment. 
You've heard me say this before. This can be the time that the church shines like never before. But the enemy will work to steal, kill, and destroy. To take away the work of the Spirit in you and in me at a time where the world needs to see us and hear us as we represent Jesus. So back to that dialogue, like I said, here we are needing the Spirit of God to be freed in us like never before, but we're being scrunched. And if you haven't felt scrunched over the last year and a half or so, I don't know where you've lived, but I've felt pretty scrunched, squeezed. Scripture says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We were talking about this in class just a few minutes ago. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So these are some of the things that I think have crept into the church. And, and maybe we've been aware at some level, but I don't think we've been completely aware I know I'm not completely aware of some of the things that rise to the surface that come out of my mouth when I wish that they didn't. Or that take root in my mind or even in my heart. I don't think you're that different than me. And so I want to invite you to identify this morning. If, if the Spirit of God is trying to do something right now, do you think the Spirit of God is trying to do something right now in the church? So if the Spirit of God, most, if you're watching online, most people said yes. <laughs> if the Spirit of God is trying to do something right now, He's probably trying to do something in me right now. Why is it not happening? And so I felt led to kind of go into some things and, and some of them might fit you today. And I'm just going to say to you, listen with me and work through this exercise here because I think it's significant. Because if the Spirit of God is trying to do something but it ain't happening, we can either blame that on Numa Puthona or we can begin to say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So here's a couple things. Five, very quickly. The first one is this. And, and as we work through this, don't let your mind go, boy, somebody here really needs to deal with that. Ask yourself if you do. The first one is grieving the spirit. Grieving the spirit. Ephesians 4, 29 and 30 say this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. This is one of the first scripture verses that I memorized a long time ago. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And here it is. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So when we read this, most of it, we get... Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And, and, and we do this. Well, I quit cussing a long time ago. Now, I never use the Lord's name in vain anymore. I took care of that. I don't tell any dirty jokes. No F-bomb comes through my mouth. The key thought of this is not about that. The key thought of this scripture is right in the middle. The second half of verse 29. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it might benefit those who listen. Are my thoughts, which produce my speech, are they building others up? 
Are they helping right now? Are the words of my Facebook page the revelation of my heart? And if they are, what do they do out there for the sake of the gospel of Christ? See, this, the heart of that passage is not about, did I quit saying bad things? Did I quit using nasty words? It's about connectivity. And that last part about grieving the Holy Spirit, it's because the Holy Spirit understands that we are, we are, we, we are injected into situations at work, at school, even on Facebook. <laughs> To inspire and encourage. And when we do not do that, but instead spread discouragement, that grieves the Holy Spirit. So what do you do with your frustrations? I heard a, I heard a friend, uh, Dr. Sims, Andre Sims, he was preaching uh, at Auburn last Sunday. He's there for a couple more weeks. And, and he used this, so I'm going to share it with you because that was really good. So, so if I'm frustrated, do I spew stuff? <laughs> or what do I do with that frustration? Because it would be stupid for me to tell you, just, just sit on it. Because that doesn't help at all. Amen? Amen? Yeah. So here's what he said, and he used the Bible. <laughs> Right? He said, you have to make a choice about your frustrations. Are you going to carry them or are you going to cast your cares upon him? And he, and he said, and I think this is true, we, carry, we try to carry too much. It, it's not that this time hasn't been frustrating. This time has been really, really frustrating. <laughs> so what do you do with that frustration? Instead of carry it, cast it. Cast your cares upon Christ. Say all of the junk of your day. I am so frustrated. And then allow for his Holy Spirit to work. Amen. Allow for his Holy Spirit to work. Some of us are carrying these things on our backs and they're like boulders. And they separate us from others. And as we've already said, they grieve the Holy Spirit. I've said too much there, but just don't suppress the anger. Bring it to God and, and don't carry it. Bring it to him and let him help you work through it by the power of his Holy Spirit. That You do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Secondly, quenching the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it just says straightforward. Do not quench the Spirit. The word quench is spenumi, spenumi, and it means to stifle. Here's the, here's the interesting thing, because in context, it means to stifle, suppress, or extinguish divine influence. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not stifle, do not suppress, extinguish the divine influence. I mean, I don't think most of us even realize sometimes when we're doing that. We're quenching the spirit. Something that has to do, again, just we've had a bad day. And so the spirit is trying to work. But, but we're somehow, we're like, we're annoyed. Kind of like Paul, but in the wrong way. Somebody is excited about what has happened in their life. And they want to share about faith things. Maybe it's somebody who's a friend. Maybe it's somebody who just, you don't even know them. But you're annoyed the, that they're having a good day. Because you're not. That is stifling the divine influence. Man, and people come into church. That song was not the one that they should. The pastor's take on that scripture. And so everything is stifled and shoved away because it didn't fit what I wanted. And so you have extinguished the divine influence. Some of you can feel the funk that I'm talking about right now. 
It's going to take a lot of divine influence. And talking to some folks online too. So folks here don't have to pay attention to this right now. Some of you feel this funk. It's in your life. It's invaded. It is that woman who has come in and she's distracting all of the good things that the Spirit wants to do. And, and you're, you're just so frustrated that you just kind of forego the whole experience and you don't allow your heart or your mind to be transformed. This is suggesting to us that we have a choice. In fact, the, the verse right before it, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, do not quench the spirit. 5.18 says, it, kind of is, it tells us how we can get to a place where we're going to be more in step with letting the spirit come. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. A thankful heart and that continuously leads us into a moment or, a, or a, a nature where we don't quench the spirit. Thirdly, ignoring the spirit. Romans 121. This is a, this is a tough verse. I, I, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. And here was the result. Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Notice what's happening in this, in this one verse. They knew God, but in essence, they ignored him. They, they neither glorified him or gave thanks to him. Interesting that thanks figures into this one too. A spirit of thankfulness. The Holy Spirit, part of his work in us is to teach us and help us to be thankful. And so they knew God, but they didn't glorify Him or gave thanks to Him. And this goes back, and I won't spend time here, but it, it goes back to that, that, that uh, paradox of God or Christ, the Holy Spirit in our life, either acting as our creator or custodian. Creator being, he is building stuff into us all the time. He's at work by the power of his spirit, growing himself in us. Or, we don't give him that freedom. We don't give him that freedom today, this moment, this second, for the Holy Spirit to say, what he's talking about right now is you. And instead, we just say, be my custodian. Whenever I'm in trouble, clean up my mess. This is why recently I've been asking you a lot and I will keep doing it. But instead of, of just saying, so here's the question of the day or here's the thought and, and let's sing now and go home. I've oftentimes stopped and I said, let's write this down. What is God saying to you? What is Jesus speaking to your heart right now? So that he can be creator. So that you do not ignore what the spirit is saying to you. My problem has never been him not speaking. My problem has always been me not listening. Fourth here, resisting the Spirit. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked people. <laughs> I'll pop my neck right there. That was, make sure. I'm not one of those. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are, you're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Who said those words? Anybody remember? Stephen. Yeah. How did it go for him after that? <laughs> yeah. They threw rocks at him until he was dead. Which tells us that people don't like being told they're resisting the Holy Spirit. I think you're resisting the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to leave that church.
They don't have the right to tell me that. Telling someone uh, most of the time that you're resisting the spirit, it turns into a debate. There's, probably, there's hardly anything that we want to defend more than our sense of, of what is in step with, with what we view the Holy Spirit has room to do. And it, and it almost always fits within my comfort zone. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit, he just always wants to do things that fit in my comfort zone. And if this church I'm at doesn't create ways for me to enjoy that, then I'll find another church that works within my comfort zone. And I'm going to believe that they're going to tell me things that help me support my comfort zone. That's really interesting because the scripture talks about being transformed. And the verb in there is not once. It's not like, I got transformed. It's transformed right up to the day that I see him face to face. Instead of being conformed. In fact, the word that's, that's used there is meta, metamorpho'o. We know a word that comes out of that, right? Metamorphosis. It's change and continuously, continuously. That's what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do. And so if we're not in some capacity being reshaped in our thinking, in our heart, even coming to a place of saying, boy, I never, I never used to want to see that person walk through the foyer or come down the hallway where I work or at school or down the street where I live. But God has opened a door for me to talk with them. And to even become friends with them. That is metamorpho. That is transformation. And that ought to be happening in us. As I said, right up to the day that we see Jesus face to face. Change. Nudged out of our comfort zone. And we just stop resisting the spirit. We need to let go of this idea that Christ came to dust us off a bit. Or to fine tune a few things or to refurbish a few things. He came to transform. You've heard this story before. I think it's, I don't know completely. I've looked this up and I'm not sure that it's, it's actually completely shared this way. But the legend is, is that when Michelangelo was asked about how he found David in that that slab of marble he his response was it was easy I just cut away everything that was not David the work of the Holy Spirit in us if we will not resist it is to cut away everything that is not as he wants us to be attitudes and actions I'm going to ask for our worship team to go ahead and come up to the platform. Now, maybe you will say, I don't grieve. I don't quench, ignore, or resist the spirit. That's just not me. I don't identify with anything that's been said so far. So I'm going to ask you to try this last one on. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of less theological. But ask yourself, do I do things that grieve the spirit? Have I done some things or do I live in a fashion that quenches the spirit or ignores or resists the spirit for the sake of my comfort zone? Ask yourselves about those too. But this last one is simple. The thing that can keep the spirit from coming and, and working through you and working through the church is holding a grudge. Just holding a grudge. See, if you're, if you're holding on to a grudge really tight, 
you're probably not holding on to the Spirit at all. Psalm 51, 3 and Psalm 32, 4, David is realizing kind of how this sin in his life has impacted him. And I love the Psalms for that because David is, is pretty transparent in some of these things. And so Psalm 51, 3, the first part of it says, I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. It's just hanging there. He doesn't find release from it. Psalm 32 verse 4 says, For day and night your hand was heavy on me, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. This is what it's like to carry or hold on to, as he talks about it, as sin. But I'm going to say holding on to a grudge too. You may not consider that sin, but I'm going to tell you this. A grudge against a person or a place uh, or anything, a grudge, it takes more energy to hold on to that. <laughs> and that's what he's responding to. He, say, he says, my strength was sapped by this sin. Holding on to a grudge against a person, place, or thing will sap your strength. You will not be able to act and live and speak in the spirit while you still hold on to a grudge. You just won't. I was uh, with our group uh, next week as part of our time together. I want to share a bunch of photos of some of the things that we've been able to be a part of through the last few few weeks. Uh, one we didn't get to meet here, and uh, but we had some really neat things that happened as a church. But I was at the Vibe. Uh, apartments when we went with the group there to uh, uh, distribute some gift cards and to sing and uh, um, and eat and uh, sit with Santa <laughs> and I was told by three or four people how much they appreciated the church coming, the, the representation of the church, probably, I don't know, 25 or 30 people who, who were there that night in the rain. But I was told by three or four people how much, uh, from the Vibe Apartments, how much they appreciated our continued injection into their community. And there was this one young man I was talking to at the very end, and his, I, I can't remember his, his full name. Um, but he said, uh, the, he said, you can call me Snow. That's what they call me. And so he was, he was there at the end and, and he was uh, drinking cocoa and, and we were talking. And um, He said this to me. He said, your church doesn't just talk about being good people. He said, they're doing good things. And I was so thankful to hear that. He didn't know I was the pastor <laughs> until I gave him a business card when I left. The church doesn't just talk about being good people. You're doing good things. That only happens in the spirit. And that only happens continuously as we remain connected to the spirit. You say, you're, it sounds like you're saying that you can never do any of this good stuff unless you have the... No, you can. But I'm just going to say to you, eventually the flesh wears out. It's only by the Spirit that you can maintain a right connection in spite of. And so if you found the flesh failing, good. That's a, that's a great thing to realize. If you, if you read through scripture, the, the next chapter in, on, in the story of almost anybody, once they found the flesh failed, then the spirit. And the spirit sustains. But the distance created between you and the spirit of God can happen through any of these things I mentioned. Things as small as holding a grudge. An attitudinal thing the other thing you'll find is that you can do good things for a while 
But if you're not doing them in the spirit, eventually it just becomes a chore. And the fulfillment of it goes away. Folks, and that's everything from going to church to going to the vibe to loving your spouse to loving your neighbor. Do it in the flesh. It becomes a chore and the strength and the fulfillment of it will, will wane. It'll disappear only in the spirit of God. And the last thing I'll say is this. If, if you have asked for Christ to be your savior, you have been given this good deposit is what Paul describes it as of the spirit. It's in you. He's in you. But if you've been resisting, quenching, ignoring any of it, there's one more and I can't think of it. The spirit doesn't have full reign and you've ceased to be transformed. Choose transformation and choose it continuously. Let's stand together.